All right, all right. I'm going to ask everybody to gather back in if we can. Gather back in. If we, is my mic on? My mic is on here. You can hear it now? Oh, it might be the mask. Oh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take this off while I preach. I'm going to put it right back on afterward. Um, man, it is so good to see all your faces today. Welcome to Tapestry Church. And um, also, I just want to say that uh, Pastor Bernard wishes he could be here. But Pastor Bernard is our lead pastor, for those of you who are new, but he is under the weather this morning. So we're going we're gonna to pray for him that he gets better quickly. Um, normally, on days where we do Discover Tapestry, uh, which is right after the service today, we would do that together. Uh, but you just get me today, unfortunately, for you. But hopefully we'll still have a good time. Uh, so I'll see some of you right outside the service, right afterward. This morning we're going to be continuing on in our series called Let There Be Light. And the first half of the series, we're talking about letting the light in. And the second half of the series, we're talking about letting the light out. We're still in the first half of the series. So we're talking about letting the light in. And we've, we've talked about letting the light of God into our lives through prayer, through scripture. And today we're going to be talking about something that's fairly unpopular. Um, so uh, buckle up and I'm sorry in advance, but I hope it's life-giving. Uh, let me pray for us. Lord, we're so grateful, so grateful, not just to be here this morning, but that, that you're here this morning. We're grateful that we did not come here alone, but that we came here through the prompting of your Spirit and your Spirit's movement in our lives. God, no matter why we decided to show up today, whether it's just a habit that we're in or whether it's something that we desperately needed, Lord, we are grateful that your Spirit moved us to be here. And we expect to hear from you this morning. We expect to experience you this morning because we know that you offer yourself generously to anybody who seeks you. So God, we pray this morning for Pastor Bernard that you would heal his body. Uh, we pray for all of those in our community who are sick right now from, from any kind of illness, COVID or anything else. We pray that you would, you would do your healing work in our lives, God. Lord, we, we pray that as we hear from you, from your word this morning, that your spirit would translate it for us into whatever we need to hear from you. Uh, I've been doing this long enough to know that it's not always what I say that gets heard. <laughs> um, and honestly, I'm grateful for that, God, because you, you use me, you use your words, you use whatever is set up here, and you translate it to what we need to hear. So God, I pray that you would do that. And uh, God, no matter who we are, no matter why we're here, I pray that you would speak to us in words we can understand. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read our scripture passage for us this morning. It is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 16. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 16. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing 
so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you don't have to be in San Francisco for too long these days to see one. And no, I'm not talking about a piece of avocado toast. I am talking about autonomous vehicles, otherwise known as self-driving cars. They wind through the streets, they stop at stop signs, they avoid mostly pedestrians, and noticeably, they do not honk at the people in front of them. Autonomous vehicles are a great word picture, I think, for how most of us in the U.S. think of ourselves. We can get around on our own just fine, can't we? We don't need anyone else in the driver's seat of our lives helping us steer. And we certainly don't need anyone pressing the brake on any plans we may have. We can drive ourselves, thank you very much. We are autonomous. Autonomy is a word that comes from two Greek words. Pastor B likes to make fun of me sometimes that I really love Greek language, and, uh, and, and I do. It's true. Uh, he can make fun of me all he wants, because it is revealing. Autonomy is a word that comes from two Greek words, autos, which means self, and nomos, which means law. Autonomy literally means being a law unto yourself. Autonomous vehicles don't need a driver because they have laws built in. They are a law unto themselves. And, and we would like to think that we are autonomous people who, for example, don't need mentors. That was for when we were younger. Don't need guides. Don't need people who could put their hands on the steering wheel of our lives. Which is why the word obey is a four-letter word in American culture. It is actually also a four-letter word just generally, but it is a four-letter word metaphorically uh, in American culture. It's, it's a curse word because the very idea of submitting ourselves, especially grown people, to another person flies in the face of this American idol we call autonomy. It's why we cringe a little bit, most of us, if we're honest, when we hear Paul's words in verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but also much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't we cringe a little bit when we hear that? There's a reason why when Christians read Philippians 2 and when pastors preach on it, we tend to stop at verse 11. I mean, I honestly cannot remember ever hearing a sermon on verse 12 and following. And I've been in church a long time. We're very happy to talk about the humility of Christ. We're very talk, happy to talk about how he humbled himself. And we're even okay with the idea that we need to be humble. As long as that means, well, we just shouldn't think too highly of ourselves. We shouldn't be jerks. But the idea of humbling ourselves before another actual person submitting our desires to their wisdom. Whew. I mean, when it comes to concrete decisions in our lives, usually it goes like this, right? We, we have some big decision that needs to be made. We think about it really carefully. We weigh the pros and cons. We make the decision, and then we inform everybody. Usually, that's how it goes. Every once in a while, we might run it past somebody. But really not, not to hear them say, ah, what you want to do is the wrong thing. But rather to hear them confirm what we already are kind of hoping to do, or maybe give us a little bit of perspective so that we can just do what we're hoping to do a little bit better than we were hoping to do it. But how many of us have recently, in the biggest decisions of our lives, asked an elder to shed some wisdom on it. 
before we made the decision. And, and, and how many of us, if they said something that we disagreed with, would actually submit to it? Should I move to take this job? Or shouldn't I? Should I marry this person? i got to be honest, I've married a handful of people in my time as a pastor, and I don't think ever, anyone has ever come to me and asked, should they? They just said, hey, this is happening. This is happening, could you help us do it? Should I keep dating this person? Should I join this church? Should I leave this church? Should I say something to this thing about my uh, say something about this thing to my parents? See, we're fine with being humble as long as it doesn't mean submission or God forbid obedience. But in this passage that we have in front of us, the apostle Paul expects that the Philippian church would continue to submit themselves to his guidance just as they have done in the past. And, and he uses the same word for obedience here as he does in verse 12. Or he, he uses the same word in verse 12 as he does in verse 8 when he's talking about Jesus being obedient to death. Being in very nature God. Listen to how he describes Jesus. Being in very nature God. He did not consider equality with God something that he had. Something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross. Think about what Paul is saying here. He is saying, oh man, if you, if you and I balk at the idea of obedience, that we shouldn't have to be obedient to anybody, being that we're adults and everything, Paul is saying that, that Jesus, though he was in very nature God, humbled himself to take on the form of a servant. And I think just maybe, maybe, I mean, call me crazy, but if God can become a servant, you and I can submit to a mentor. I'm going to say that one more time. If God can become a servant, you and I can submit to a mentor. Paul suggests that we should not only submit, but that we should do it with our whole heart. That's why he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I did my fair share of grumbling and arguing. You know, my, my parents would say to do something and... At the beginning of that process, I would argue, right, so that I didn't have to do that thing. Uh, why, why should I have to do that? What's the point? My, my brother never had to do that. That doesn't even make sense. Whatever. But when I lost the argument, inevitably, or, or more frequently when my parents just got so exasperated, they said, because I said so, I started complaining. I started complaining in the process of doing it. I'll do it, but I'm not going to like it. I'll do it, but you can't force me to enjoy it. My heart doesn't have to be in it. I'll obey you like someone who isn't wise enough or loving enough to know my best interests or have them at heart. Not out of love and trust. But Paul says we're not only to obey but we're to have the heart of humility that prompts the obedience to begin with. We're, we're to have a heart of trust that prompts the submission in the first place. That a heart like Jesus' own heart, as the prophet describes him, as a lamb before his shears was silent. So he did not open his mouth when he went to the cross. That right there, friends, if you, if, if you follow Jesus, that should be enough to kill our pride. The fact that the God of the universe could become obedient to anything, but especially death, the giver of life itself, become obedient to death, that ought to mean that you and I are not above submitting to somebody. But as soon as that pride is removed, the fear takes its place. And, and, and some of you have been feeling this fear since I started using the words submit and obey this morning. Uh, 
a fear that is legitimate and real. That submission feels dangerous to us. How, how do we know? How can we possibly trust that this person that I'm submitting to or supposedly supposed to submit to uh, actually has our best interests, my best interests at heart? How, how can we trust that this person or group of people isn't going to violate our trust, especially if my trust has been violated before? It's an important question because, because very frequently, or at least too often, in relationships like this, in, a, in what Christians like to call a discipleship relationship or a mentoring relationship, those relationships have been abused. And we need to be real about that in the church, especially. These relationships have sometimes been abused, and, and, and it's sadly true in the church as well as elsewhere. A call to obedience and submission has a long history of being abused in religious contexts. I, I just met someone a month ago who uh, they were just at, having it sounded like a Bible study in a coffee shop, like a few, like three or four guys, and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm meeting somebody else here in Oakland who's studying the Bible in the open. I gotta meet these people. So I interrupted their Bible study and I introduced myself. We got to talking and and, uh, and they started inviting me to their, to their stuff for their ministry. And I was like, oh, cool, right on. Thanks for the invitations. And, and what, what church are you a part of? And they told me, and I you know, logged it in my memory. And I was like, okay, cool, right on. I told them about tapestry, and we shook hands and exchanged numbers and went away. And I Googled their church. And I found out they're in a cult. I did not know this when I was talking to them, and I don't think I would have ever noticed it until... You know, I dug a little deeper. But in this particular cult, actually the second person I've met who's a part of that, um, they, 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 the, the part of the feature of the cult is that they have very, very, very strict discipleship. I'll say discipleship, since this is a visual medium online. Uh, very strict discipleship. By that I mean every single person has a disciple or a mentor, and those mentors have control over the way you dress or cut your hair, who you're allowed to see or talk to or date, where you live, with whom you live. That chain of so-called discipleship is unbroken all the way up to the top in the case of this particular community. But there is, there's a more subtle way of using conversation of submission and obedience to gain power and control. There's a type of church that, that talks about submission in order to maintain control and order. And, and that's why we have to be really, really, really clear here. That, that would be a, a toxic culture that uses this language, this biblical language, to dominate. For the good of the people who are in power. Not for the good of the people who are being called to submit. And that can't be farther from the vision that the Apostle Paul has for the Philippian church, for his relationship with the Philippian church. It can't be farther from it. I mean, do you see how he refers to them in verse 12? My dear friends. My dear friends. The, I'm going to go back to the Greek. The word is actually, it's agapetos. It comes from the Greek word agape. My beloved. That is... That is the relationship that Paul has with the Philippian church. They, they are his beloved. Friends, we, we need to let our pride die so that we can have the capacity to practically humble ourselves and submit to another. But we also need to have wisdom with regard to who we submit ourselves to. Is it clear that they're walking with Jesus? Is it clear that they love Jesus? Is it clear to us that they love and want the best for us, too? And that last question is a difficult one, to be honest with you. I mean, so often we take that for granted, but that last question can be a difficult one to answer because we cannot let the answer to that question, whether they really love us and have our best interests at heart, depend on them thinking exactly the way we think about ourselves or about our situation or our desires or experiences. 
If the person you submit to always thinks the way you think, you don't have a mentor. You have a mirror. We need actual mentors. We need actual guides in our lives to let the light in that we could not let in on our own. It, it, somehow we need to be able to di differentiate, don't we, between, between someone who loves us and someone who simply rubber stamps everything that we think about. We haven't given that person the authority to, to grab the wheel or hit the brakes if that's the person that we're asking for. Right? We're, we're still an autonomous vehicle. They're just riding in the passenger seat taking notes, analyzing the data. Here's the question I, I would love for you to take into your connect groups this week if you're a part of a Tapestry Connect group. Other than agreeing with what I think about my life and what to do with my life, how can I tell or how have I discerned in the past if a potential mentor or guide or elder really loves me? How can I tell or how have I discerned in the past how a, that a potential mentor or guide or elder really loves me? Well, I want to suggest in a, in a partial, in a 15,000 foot view answer to that question, that not only is Jesus the perfect example of humility and submission, he is also the epitome of a loving Lord. You see, ultimately, we have been called to submit ourselves to Jesus. Even all of this submitting that we do need to do to other human beings who are right in front of us is really a way of submitting ourselves through them to Jesus. And, and, and Jesus is, is Jesus the type of Lord who, who seeks power and control at the expense of those in his care? Not in the slightest. Jesus is the type of Lord who gives up his advantage and he, and he seeks the good of his beloved at his own expense. Jesus wasn't obedient to death for the sake of obedience. He was obedient to death for our sake, for the sake of the ones that he loves. Paul, we come to find out, sacrificed for the Philippians as well. He, he's writing this letter to the Philippians from a prison cell. And, and he's in that prison because he came to the Philippians and others with this gospel, this message of good news that flew in the face of the power structures of the day that sought to dominate and control. He obeyed Jesus in bringing this message to his beloved, and it cost him. That's why Paul can with all credibility say, My beloved, as you have always obeyed, now, much more in my absence than you did when I was with you. Keep doing that. Don't you see, it, it, when you look at the passage in, in verse 9, I mean, the Bible goes one step farther. What's the, it answers the question, what's the relationship between, between sacrificial love and spiritual authority? What's the relationship between sacrificial love and spiritual authority? Well, in verse 9, it says, Therefore, after Jesus had submitted himself to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted Jesus. He, was, he submitted himself in obedience to death. Therefore, God exalted Jesus. He did it because Jesus humbled himself to the lowest possible depth. God exalted him to the highest possible height. And he gave him the highest place in, in the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now you see, Jesus' exaltation comes after his submission. After his obedience. He showed through his obedient, self-sacrificial love that we are truly his beloved. He gave up his very life for us. So in the same way that the Philippians knew when Paul is saying, my beloved, that he meant it because he was in prison for them. Oh, how much more do we know that when Jesus says, my beloved, he means it. 
Because he gave up his very life for us. And when the God of the universe is willing to do that on our behalf, friends, that is someone to whom we can bow the knee. That is someone we can call Lord. That is someone that we can trust to have our best interests at heart. And in the same way, this is something that I love in this passage, in the same way that Jesus, through his humility and submission, was then glorified by God, so we who follow him through the wise counsel of others in our lives, without grumbling and arguing, but wholeheartedly and joyfully, Paul says that we too will shine like stars in a dark sky. When we let the light of Jesus into our lives by, by submitting to him through loving mentors like Paul, the light doesn't just get in. The light gets out and shines on the world around us. Thanks be to God.